statistical model of scientific understanding a response to patents. Patents. Okay. Uh, who is not here now? So, uh, first of all, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I was I was really happy to have not only the amazing keynote speakers that we had, but uh, also the other participants. I, I think all the topics and all the talks have been great so far, and I cannot expect anything less from such an amazing people. Um, and, of course, tomorrow will be also a very great day, I, I hope so. And, and so, I, you might not know this, but I have been a student here and I have been visiting Ghent sometimes now, and I have been working with Diederik on philosophy of science more than likely. So Diederik has this paper, which I will mention, oh, this is more, which I will mention later, but um, so he has this paper. Do we need the hierarchical model of science? And he wrote this in um, 1991 or something like that. Oh, yeah, the date is there. And so I read it and I worked on applications of logic to understanding philosophy of science, inconsistency in science, as a matter of fact. And then I thought that he had very, very good points there. So, as some of you might know, uh, on and off, I work also on scientific understanding. And not so on and off, I work on inconsistent science. So this study is going to be a mix of, of those things and a mix of uh, an analysis of the paper. So the aim of this talk is to answer these two questions. Can we have a hierarchical model of scientific understanding? And if so, what is the role of scientific understanding when explaining the tolerance of defectiveness in the science? Here I will only focus on the case of inconsistencies and, and I will answer yes to the first question. And I would say that it could be explanatory as, uh, as to why, how, and how scientists tolerate certain effects in their day-to-day -day practice, in particular the case of contradictions. So the plan for this talk is, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about this Diederik's paper. Um, after that, I'm going to say something about scientific understanding. I will try to claim that even if we agree with physics at the level of knowledge, of scientific knowledge, he claims that it is not important, that it is not clear if we can achieve a hierarchical model of scientific knowledge, but that it is not so important as it might not be uh, really explanatory of scientific practice, for instance. So I would say that even if we agree with him, that doesn't happen at the level of scientific understanding. And for that, I will say a brief uh, introduction about the relation between knowledge and understanding related to science. And then I will present an example, the case of contradictions in neutrino physics. And I will explain if this model, in a sense, can, it, can explain how scientists pass from tolerating a contradiction to tolerate something different than that contradiction in the same, like in the same framework, in a sense. And then I will say something like some conclusions. Doesn't work. Sorry. The paper. As I mentioned before, Peter wrote this paper. It's a very short uh, paper on how if we can actually achieve, achieve a hierarchical model of science, which is only focused on scientific knowledge. And then he introduces very briefly what he considers to be a hierarchical model of science. So it has to satisfy two, two conditions at least. It is a stratified, this means it has different layers, and also the items of some layer are or should be justified in terms of items of a higher layer. Say, like, you want to achieve this one in order to get to this one. I hope I am reconstructing you well. <laughs> at least. Um, and so it is a stratified. And, and when we look at the literature in philosophy of science, in general philosophy of science, we can find many of these type of models. Uh, for instance, this one is about evidence in medicine and how you go from one single case study, you add more information, more uh, methodological norms and things like that, and then you move to descriptive studies. And then you move to conceptual studies. And then you go to generalized studies, which are like the most desirable results in um, analyzing methodology of medical doctors, for instance, of the study of medical doctors. 
Um, we also think that there is something like that in epistemology. Like people tend to believe that we have more beliefs, but that we really want to have true beliefs, and after that we have we want to have justified beliefs, and after that we want whatever it knowledge is. If it is like uh, robust enough against get the other examples or something like that, if we add the next criterion, then we get knowledge, and that's really what we want. When we are having beliefs, in a sense, normatively, we want to get knowledge. Um, and so in, in the old literature, in the traditional view of philosophy of science, we have this like a stratified model that was, well, we have discovery, but the epistemic game of the discovery is that at the end we have justification. Like, and then we had at least two topics, discovery and justification, and we were going to move from here to here with more um, epistemic constraints and the epistemic achievement that we get at the end is more valuable than the epistemic achievement that you get uh, at the beginning. Later on, people like Loud and protested and said, like, no, 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 wait, even, even if one wants something like hierarchical, we want to add something else into it. For instance, context of pursuit. But it's still hierarchical in a sense. I'm not saying that Loud and was defending this model, but he was one of the ones presented that in between there should be a context of pursuit at least. Um, so that was the idea of being stratified. Some examples in the philosophy of science. And so the second point was that the items of some layer are or should be justified in terms of the items of a higher layer. This is, according to Diedrich, decisions at a lower level derived directly from the items at a higher level. What he's thinking about is stratifying, it's not so clear in the paper at least. So it could be like scientific disciplines. For instance, people who believe that uh, physics is more foundational than other disciplines. And, or it could be types of knowledge. Maybe we want a more robust knowledge at the end in sciences, but we can go from, for instance, knowledge by um, like collective knowledge or um, by testimony, for instance, and then we keep moving to a more strict sense of knowledge. It could be also types of justification. It could be empirical data. So uh, sometimes we can allow for things to be a bit loose, but still empirically adequate. But here we want really sophisticated empirical data. We can also uh, be thinking about truth to get closer to truth. So. Well, here we can accept things that look like could be the case. Here we want things that we can actually call certainties or something like that. And so on and so forth. We can stratify uh, many of the things that in the literature of philosophy of science have been listed as desirable. And things that also have been listed as like day-to-day -day results, epistemic results. So, also, something that it's not so clear in the paper, in the paper, is what he's saying in, or what he's thinking that hierarchical models should um, should be in the, in a normative sense. What is enough for them to be hierarchical? Are all of these things that we can imagine when we think in, of a hierarchy, or only some of them are enough for calling something a hierarchical model of science? So imagine that one of his constraints or one of his worries is that the model should be cumulative. So whatever I have here, I retain it, but make it more sophisticated in the next day, and so on and so forth. And so this contains still the important part of the lower layer, but it's more sophisticated, it's more restricted, it's more informative in a sense. Or maybe it's about certain how epistemic agents think that they have like reached something like a like a unique truth or um, something that will not change and so on and so forth. Or is it about something like metaphysical foundation? So we go from something that is theoretically useful to something that we now know that it's at the basis of um, our scientific knowledge about the world or something like that. Is it about empirical legacy again? Is it about accuracy? Is it about truth? Well, it is not so clear, but what is clear is that there are certain directions. So first of all, we want Whatever is here, to get here. And whatever is here has to have like 
and import also to the down part in order to constrain the vessels. Uh, and so, with that in mind, Gillick says that there are many problems. So, for instance, if we think about uh, theoretical models in terms of justificatory relations, then we have to be very careful because when we look at the scientific practice, like the actual scientific practice, it is not so clear that the relation of justifying one type of statements to justify other types is so straightforward. Actually, it is quite messy. I mean, in the worst cases, the other is worried about it being like um, related an infinitum, so like an infinite regress. I always need to appeal to something else in order to justify whatever I am in the in the hierarchy. Then. And that is something that humans cannot do because they cannot compute uh, infinite yeah, insights. At least. So are they worried about absolute certainties? If they are, uh, at least history of science so far has shown that that's not a very like reliable aim. So many of the things that scientists tend to believe that were certainties at the moment are abandoned already, or we have discovered that they were not uh, as strong as we expected. And also, he has this point on disagreement. So he says, well, one can think in abstract sense that there are some kind of entities that we can call certainties. Uh, if we look at epistemic communities and they disagree about those things between each other, so that can say something about the epistemic commitments that they can have uh, towards those things that we call certainties in abstract sense. And that might say something about the hierarchical model. At least it cannot be absent. Now, also, it, it seems problematic to stop in some point only because we, we want an instrumental stuff. And it is problematic in the sense that if we have bought any of these commitments, then we, all of them are strongly related to objectivity in an also strong sense. So if we want to stop only because we want to stop, then that doesn't look so good either. And so he um, calls attention to like problem solving approaches. We all know what that means. We all know that problem solving usually um, understands that information in science is, is most of the time incomplete, and that one problem can be solved or can be approached by different views and uh, from different methodologies and from different disciplines and so on and so forth. And so what did they? discovered in this paper is that what we thought that was a very ordered uh, and neat model, it's quite a mess. And this is something that I really like about the paper. So he, he mentions how can we understand or how can we approach this type of, um, of knowledge in the sciences. So he, he mentions that at least we have to have a problem if we are going to take a um, problem solving approach in order to explain how disciplines move forward, then we have to find a set of problems, a set of participants, as scientists uh, really play uh, an important role in the development of science, uh, a set of certainties, but these certainties are going to be, as we know, contextual in a sense, uh, will be related to a particular theory or a particular framework, if frameworks are understood uh, in a looser sense. Um, also, they will find uh, certain statements that relate the problem with the context in such a way that they are relevant for solving the problem. And also some methodological constraints that are given by the discipline. But what happens is that if we accept all that in order to go and see scientists working, uh, then we have to accept that this is just going to be contextual. That if we change one of these things, then we have a totally different approach to science, or to at least to certain particular science, uh, scientific problems. So, for instance, uh, the problem of the perihelion of Mercury, the famous anomaly. So, the famous anomaly said that they were expecting Mercury to move like this, but it was moving like weirdly in this part, in the very outer. And so, what happens? Well, if you are like a really um, theoretical philosopher of science and you expect to say, oh, oh, wait, the theory is mistaken, the theory doesn't work. And then you start taking this, this approach that 
certain physicists at the time to, uh, to say, well, this is an anomaly, this doesn't look good, we have to solve it. Uh, if you agree, as Vitalik was mentioned, one can recognize at least different types of inconsistencies in the empirical sciences. One of those is uh, contradictions between theory and observation. So if you grant that, and you look at this anomaly, as it wasn't solving very easily, uh, then you grant the fact that it was considered a contradiction. And many of the scientists at the time were demanding consistency. However, there, there were also other communities that were happy with the presence of the anomalies. Because what they were saying is, every time that an anomaly pops up, it allows us to discover something new about the relation between our theory and the world. And so uh, every time that they were finding an anomaly, they, they were taking it in positive, in a sense. So the ex explanation can, uh, can help us to understand what was happening. So the methodological constraints uh, change from one context to another, because these were obviously different contexts. Uh, the characterization of the problem also was different. Like the empirical phenomena in an abstract sense could have been the same, but the characterization was different. And so that, is, that kind of evidence of the historical record, in a sense, supports the idea of going from this type of model to something more messy and more varied, in a sense. That's <laughs> that's a, uh, and also uh, something that is very important, and that this is not contained in his paper, but it's contained in his work, is that sometimes. Uh, if we look at the historical record, we see something that scientists believe that was a contradiction, and after a few years the, and more information they discovered it was not a real contradiction, but that it was something like an explanatory gap. So when they only have Newtonian theory, then they were even calling it sometimes a contradiction. But when Einstein came and gave a uh, theory of relativity, and could explain the phenomenon, then it was clear that it was an explanatory gap that uh, the theory in itself, the Newtonian theory, could not cover. So that now we understand what was happening. And this is something very nice. So uh, from a point of view such as Diederich, then we can move uh, from one context to another, and then we can explain how um, contradictions become explanatory gaps, or descriptive gaps, or predictive gaps, and so on and so forth. And keep this in mind because it's true. So what really happens with scientific knowledge is that we can we don't need a hierarchical model of scientific knowledge, according to Dudrick, because um, even if we could achieve something like that, it would not be descriptive or explanatory of what he has characterized as scientific practice. It could be descriptive of something like uh, our ideals of scientific practice or about the future of science, like the long run future of science, but so far it's not explanatory of our day to day practice. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, I wanted to answer this question. Even what Dirk has said in this paper can we have a hierarchical model of scientific understanding? First of all, uh, it is not so clear what understanding is, what scientific understanding is. So there is a lot of literature, the majority of it is recent literature, on where to place scientific understanding. Does it require knowledge? Does it need to require knowledge? Does it require explanation? Does it need? Uh, what is actually uh, important for identifying something that we can call understanding, legitimate understanding? And what are the other things over there? So something that almost every author has in common is to say that understanding is an epistemic phenomenon that is related to what we call grasping. Some can say up to the feeling of grasping. Like when I actually realize that I have discovered something new, that now I can see a connection, or something that could be described as grasping in the sense of relating things that before we're like imagined to be apart. Um, so grasping is usually something that could be translated to putting things together. And they could be put together in the sense of being more fine grained So you have many things in, in
in a very general sense. And suddenly you get like understanding about how they could be related in a, in a more fine-grained sense. Uh, it could be related to objects. So now I can connect more objects that I thought were not related. Now I can see, for instance, the chairs. Now I suddenly can see that all these objects are chairs and they are part of one same category. They have the same color. They are here for the same purpose, and so on and so forth. Uh, or some can say that uh, understanding can be also related to truth. So from going, uh, from having different things that I think to, they could be candidates for the partial truth, I suddenly realize that they are actually, in a sense, true. Um, also, one can find in the literature that understanding is said to be, that could be either explanatory or not explanatory. And there is no common agreement yet on how it should be. In addition, the non-explanatory understanding can be of different things. Uh, and it is not so clear how much this is actually like uh, philosophically relevant, and it's not only the way in which people, like in their day-to-day -day life, use the term understanding. So one can be propositional understanding, which is I understand what the proposition that you are giving me uh, means. I broad linguistic understanding, so like I can understand English. Uh, narrow linguistic procedural understanding that corresponds in a sense to uh, procedural knowledge, so they are in a sense related. And non explanatory interrogative understanding. So for instance, who, how, where, what, when, so on and so forth. How is responded with procedure. Um, now, actually in the literature, there, there have been suggested certain models of, of, of scientific understanding. For instance, people tend to believe that all of these other cases, the ones that I mentioned before, of non-explanatory understanding are put there in order for us to get explanatory understanding. That's a good one. When we can identify causes, when we can identify like true relations between things, then that's what we are, we are aiming at. Others have said, okay, that's not the way to order. Uh, the hierarchical model should be between factive and non-factive. So, factive are the things, objectual understanding, it's about like the actual objects. And so, uh, this is the way in which they satisfy the factive condition that epistemologists prepares for knowledge. So, if that could be the case, if something is actually the case, then it is it's satisfying the factive condition. But things in science such as models, scientific models, or abstractions, or idealizations, in a sense, do not satisfy fully the uh, factive condition. So they have to be moderately factive. And there are certain things, non-factive, that are like uh, really abstract objects, or um, it really depends on what you have in mind when thinking about abstractions, or uh, fictional objects. Then those are non-factive. And, that under, and understanding fictions, it's not so important as understanding things about the world, the actual world. Um, and so it could be explanatory understanding about uh, and be graded according to the factive condition, and non explanatory understanding that it can also be factive or non factive or moderately factive. And so, but Remember all this, the Diedrich said. Maybe because knowledge is an epistemic phenomenon that seems, in a sense, very related to understanding, maybe with all these people that are proposing the hierarchical models of scientific understanding and mistake, maybe there is no way, uh, there's no way to order, uh, in a growing sense or something like that, uh, scientific understanding. As if one thinks that Diedrich is correct, there is no such a way for scientific knowledge. And, and that is very compatible with things like the literature and expertise uh, related to understanding. So there, there are certain degrees that we expect for people to show when, for instance, when you were in primary school and you went to a science fair, uh, then 
Of course, you were not expected to be able to understand the math behind the theories that they were explaining to you. But you were, in a sense, expected to understand some. And when you went to primary school, and when you went to secondary school, and so on and so forth, it seems like the, the limit was going up and up. And so there, there's some literature that supports the idea that understanding can be contextual in that sense. Also, um, Algin has said something that we can achieve understanding via exemplification. And the types of understanding that we gain are at least at least three types. So for instance, one can identify salient features and show it to somebody. One can see what, what that person is, is presenting and provide another exemplar of the same type and explain how is it of the same type and not of other type. And one can also discover some new properties of an exemplar when trying to do any of those things. Um, and as I said, uh, knowledge and understanding are usually related with the literature. And people are still wondering where they are. So usually people think that uh, if one considers understanding to be related to explanation, then we want the factive condition to be satisfied, and we want uh, understanding to be close to knowledge. But if I want uh, understanding to be non-explanatory, then we don't care about the factive condition so much. And then understanding is previous to knowledge. How can we say so? Well, for instance, the kids that go to a science fair, they can understand something without really knowing what the theory is. And that is compatible with that, right? Well, I suggest that I, I get the impression that they are mistakenly uh, ordering these things as if they were not complementary. So I think that one could design layers, or one can identify layers, where objectual or model understanding could like, be at the same level. Either understanding can be about objects or about other things, such as uh, fictions or scientific theories in abstract sense, or about the structures, for instance, that can be involved. And both can be explanatory or not explanatory. As we can find explanations about how uh, things connect in a structure, even if we don't know if the structure is satisfied in the outside world, for instance. And the other thing relate to the other types of understanding that I have mentioned. Well, it seems that, uh, for instance, it has been mentioned that there is a maximal sense of understanding. Well, everything can be put together and make sense together. Uh, everything that we have, not everything that can be known about the world, things like that. But we can say, at the beginning, we have this positive identification that Algin or that I was talking about. When we can identify the properties that an exemplar has with the thing that it's, it's now exemplified, the, the relations. But we can also have the positive and the negative identity. So when I say why this chair is an exemplar of, for instance, this other chair, but why they are not the same. Uh, and then we can go up to the next level where we can find after lightning, which is I can understand something that I never saw coming, and now I have to uh, the ability of explaining things such as structural connections between things or so on and so forth. And then we have contextual expertise where Direct knowledge, contextual knowledge, can easily be found here. And then we can keep moving uh, until we get to maximal understanding. But if we look in the literature, what maximal understanding is, it's something that is very close to coherence. So now we, we have a way to grow upstairs. So here, in maximal understanding, we have to have consistency, compatibility, and reinforcement. So it's not only that the things that we have together are mutually consistent, but they are talking about the same thing. And that's the, the sense of understanding, to integrate things. Um, and also, that when put together, we can see that they can allow for new inferences and new relevant inferences. So um, I think with this, we, we have a way to grow up. And it, it will not give us certainties, and it will not give us uh, metaphysical foundations, it can tell us something about empirical legacy, I'm not really sure, um, or accuracy, but it for sure will be commuted. And I will skip the case of inconsistency there. And I will go there. So it, it will be cumulative, 
Because when we find out that something that we thought that was true, that was part of the objectual section, is not, then we don't have to lose it. We don't have to send it down. We can just move it to objectual to model. And now we know it's not true, but it doesn't mean that we don't understand. It's like uh, the theory of logistics. We understand what was happening there, but we also know that it will not be satisfied in the outside world. So the understanding, uh, in contrast to knowledge, we can keep it. We only move to a different, I don't know, if type or area. And so I think, yes, we can have a hierarchical model of scientific understanding, and that it can be explanatory of how scientists move from something that they thought was in one side to another and still not lose uh, the level of understanding that they have achieved. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for this lively presentation. <laughs> I, love it. I love the table. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Maria. This is yeah. very nice. Uh, I have a, a yeah. couple of questions. Um, it wasn't exactly clear to me what is the kind of moderate facticity, uh -huh. right? Uh, it seems to me that either something is factual or it's not. Right? It's hard to see how you can have something in between. Right? Um, and, uh, and also, um, why, you know, moving to your positive proposal, why even want a kind of uh, hierarchical uh, understanding? But yeah, it's possible that under understanding is something similar to completeness that you never have a full understanding. There are always things still that might be puzzling around or other things that need to be uh, developed further. Mm -hmm. In which case, why even aim for something like a hierarchical uh, picture of understanding? Maybe the understanding comes in bits and pieces. Right? You understand certain parts of things, um, and that illuminates other things, uh, and then sometimes by illuminating those things, you realize that you didn't understand all the thoughts you, you thought, and then you need to get that up. Uh, but I think that's part of, even though, you, uh, so I think the, 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 the crucial point is probably give up the, uh, the idea that uh, understanding requires uh, truth. And if you do that, things can still be explanatory, even though they need not mm -hmm. be true, uh, because they do give understanding. I think Aristotelian yeah. physics does give us an understanding of how things uh, go, why they fall, even though it's false. Um, so, the, so the, in other words, why aim for some kind of hierarchical understanding in the end? So first, the moderate uh, factivity. Uh, it's that's not something that I have came up with. Oh, yeah. So in the literature, uh, there is common agreement that there are certain things that are in between fictions and like uh, objectual understanding. So for instance, it is objectual if I am talking about you and or I'm talking about the the cop, but it is not so clear how like highly idealized models connect to the world. So. People tend to believe that, of, of course, there are certain elements that are present in the models that are present in the real world, even if not all of the elements of the world are present in the model. So that's what they call like uh, moderate effectivity. Yeah, but then it's not effective because there are things that just don't hold. So what happens is there is just partial information, right? So some parts of the model capture certain things. Well, just don't. You can call it like partial factivity because they are talking about no, like no, no, no factivity. No, but see, <laughs> it's it's um, it's like when you say not exactly you, but uh, when people say that a theory that has one one inconsistency is not true, like it's false. We know that there is a strict sense in which that holds, but that that's not a relevant sense in order to evaluate scientific practice as our theories tend to have like many flaws all over them, right? And so we said like, oh, that's a partial true like uh, a theory or it's overall true in a, in a loose sense. 
So in that sense, it's what they are calling this like moderate, moderate de facto. Um, and so and the hierarchical model. So I have the impression that all these people think that they are talking about just one phenomenon. The only thing that they don't uh, don't agree on is where the, the actual phenomenon of understanding is located. What it seems to me that it's happening is that they are talking about a very general common phenomenon that they are locating in different places because it is like particularly different in each case. And that uh, this hierarchical model, what in a sense orders is how all these proposals can be combined together in order to give us a, a type of understanding of what understanding is in global sense. I, I don't think all of them are mistaken. I think they are not seeing the whole picture. Um, so I wanted to ask about this claim that understanding is cumulative in a way that knowledge is not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's true, I suppose, that uh, we can still understand, but just on theory. Um, if we could understand theories in the mm -hmm. past, we probably still can. But it's not at all clear to me that it's important to science that we do so. Um, the sense in which we want to say science is cumulative is that you know it really matters that we keep building on what we found in the past and so observations we've made in the past uh explanations we've put forward in the past ideally we hold on to them some we've lost something if someone burns all the journals we now no longer know about the photoelectric effect whatever it mm -hmm. is but and but while it's true that we could still understand theory it's not obvious that scientifically it's important that we do so might be important for history and philosophy of science or sociology or something, but it's not clear to me that like physics is really harmed if physicists just forget that there ever was a uh, phlogiston theory. Okay. But, uh, first, I I think I never said that it was a name for science to. Uh, achieve like a cumulative approach of understanding. I, I, I think I never said so. Uh, and after that, well, it seems that it is important because when you understand what, what went wrong with the theory, then it helps in a sense to make sense what can be going wrong with the actual theories that we have, we have nowadays. And uh, as understanding is, is something that consists of putting things all together and combining information and allowing for more inferences to like to come, then it seems that to have more clear information, it's always useful. I guess I, mean, I was thinking that the, the hierarchy, the, the cumulativity of yeah. knowledge is a normative notion already. It's not an empirical claim that as a matter of fact, scientists never forget anything. It's a normative claim. This is what scientists ought to do. They ought to accumulate information um, and so I was interpreting the claim that um, understanding was cumulative in an analogously normative way but maybe I was but no and, and I also think that it's uh, it's quite different because understanding always helps to achieve more understanding in a sense so even if it's not factive even if you realize that it is it's a false theory or whatever now that you have like more clear connections between the things, then you can just use them to see uh, if other things connect in the same way, uh, so on and so forth. And then you get more understanding and so in contrast to knowledge. Okay. If there are no other questions, because I, I feel a bit awkward asking questions about this topic. <laughs> well, in a sense, I'm somewhat confused that you call a, a response to, to me. Because the idea was simply of that that uh, old paper. The idea was to argue against an um, hierarchical justification mm -hmm. in the sciences, and then to broaden it a little bit towards problem solving, and arguing problems are not solved by looking at the totality of our knowledge, what I called in my talk, a uh, monolithic block using the scientific methods all together mm -hmm. and so on and so on but rather you solve this in a context so i use context as uh, equivalent as as uh, synonym with problem solving uh, situation 
And then the idea is with respect to different problems, you get different bits of relevant knowledge that you invoke there. Mm -hmm. And you also invoke different, and I'm sure I call it in the paper like that, do's and don'ts from methodological, uh, in, in what methodological respect. So I avoid to use something like the scientific method, but rather refer to some rules of thumb that, that you apply. So, for example, if you are looking for an explanation, you are not looking at the whole of your knowledge, but you are trying to explain it from a certain theory, and then even from parts of a certain theory, those that you consider as relevant, that was where this fourth element came in, and, and then you use what you have learned, depending on, you, you may want a causal explanation or a descriptive explanation, and so on and so on, but then that, that will depend on what you know from the present literature, maybe what the scientist was trained to, to apply and so on. So, without complaining about anything you said, I, I, I just, I'm not sure that there is an opposition between uh, the fact that you use hierarchy, because of course I know there are hierarchies everywhere, in yes. <laughs> theory and, and, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Uh, but... It was just to call your attention. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay. Yep. So, do you want to? Uh, no, I, I, no. As Diederik mentioned, uh, for instance, when he was referring to the fact that for knowledge we don't look at the whole body of knowledge that mm -hmm. we have in order to get new, uh, it seems that it doesn't happen when with understanding, right? Because we mm -hmm. we look to large parts of what we have already understood in order to understand new things. So. Uh, you don't think so, so now it's a response no, to you. I don't think so because, <laughs> I mean, I understand something of how, well, I understood 40 years ago a bit how a motor worked, okay? Mm -hmm. So a motor of a car. So when I first met you, I did not use that at all. <laughs> I did not use my understanding of a motor in order to understand Maria. But understanding is in a sense, or like, uh, Will willingly oriented or something like that. So it it is of course like you didn't use the whole uh, body of understanding that you had, but yes, uh, indeed the whole body of understanding about, uh, for instance, people or the, uh, how the world works in order to certain parts of how the world works in order to see. Uh, if I was actually sitting where I was sitting, or if I was just an illusion and things like that. Like understanding facilitates more understanding in a, in a sense. It doesn't need that, that you always use everything together. Uh, jerarchical models are not about using everything together. I, I think so. Should we, uh, yes, we, we should should move to two more questions. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my question is just a clarificatory question. You, when you were talking, when you were talking about um, how you couldn't have a theoretical model of knowledge, uh, on the assumption that you couldn't have that, but you could have a theoretical mm -hmm. model of understanding, in one of your categories, you have that if you we should understand those uh, that that type of understanding as model. Uh huh. Um, and I was wondering uh, why model specifically? Because so my thinking is just that. Uh, if you're using model categories to, to classify understanding as, as if you, we were talking about some possibility or something which isn't realized but it's still possible, then you might be uh, overlooking many things which maybe are not possible but we can still understand. So, I mean, that, that seems pretty strange, but for example, in philosophy, uh, you know, there are many discussions where people seem claim to understand what's going on, and many of those theories can be compatible. <laughs> or if one of those theories are true, then maybe it's necessarily true. So every other uh, theory in opposition to that would be incompatible. So, um, so that so the, the the point is only that on the typical understanding of what model is, model model notions are very restricted to just possibility space mm -hmm. and possibility space sometimes too restricted for representation or uh, or other types of understanding. 
Well, for instance, uh, the model the model group is in the literature in order to oppose to objectual to the objectual class of understanding. And so, uh, what I think is that even if you don't satisfy the factive condition, for instance, in fictions or in abstract theories, then you can still uh, see how the elements of the theory relate to each other. Then uh, they they assume it is possible to construct like a logical space for that theory, and then to explore it can assure you to achieve more understanding. The more you explore the logical possibilities in that theory or, wh or whatever fiction you are thinking about, then uh, the closer you are to achieve more and more understanding. So. Right, I mean, just a quick follow up. You can have, I, I think, so my, my suggestion would be just to just drop the model notion because you can have logical space and not conflate that with modality. So that, I mean, those, those two categories can go together, but they are not necessarily, um, but that's, thank you. Okay, so we have a last question. Thank you, Maria, for your talk. Uh, my question is about uh, the taxonomy of epistemic groups. Uh, concerning the criterion of the factive condition, because what, one way of uh, differentiating between knowledge and understanding uh -huh. is, to, is to say that knowledge satisfies the factive condition. condition. But what about justified true meaning? Because we have uh, a condition of true, so the, the, mm -hmm. we have the, um, the factive condition, but we don't have knowledge because we are not satisfying uh, the true conditions. Uh, so uh, could we include uh, justified true belief in the taxonomy of epistemic goods provided by science, or is justified true belief a, a sort of understanding? That's the I, I, I would think that accidentally it could like uh, fall in, in one of the categories of understanding, um, but it shouldn't necessarily be be seen as that because when people are thinking that uh, you have understanding for instance without knowledge so they they have no clarity about which other conditions could not satisfy that thing that you call understanding uh they only are thinking i i believe um about either the justification criterion because they are going to relate it to explanation in the end or to like the factive condition. But I don't think they are considered, for instance, what happens if you have not satisfied the Gettier robustness condition. So um, I, I I would have no no idea of where they, would they place it in, in the groups that they have already in the literature. Okay. So thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. Thank you all of you for your attendance. And, and I think this is the Yes. Okay, so thank you. See you, see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. here in the same room. Uh, people who are watching online keep watching. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, so see you at 10 here. Uh, it's going to be Quentin, uh, the first speaker, who is going to talk about scientific realism and idealizations, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So see you tomorrow then. Thank you very much.